time for a paper review. What's making the headlines in the papers this morning with the second coming of Dr. Constance Ikoku. Uh, yes, the second <laughs> advent <laughs> of Constance. Good morning. To look at the headlines today with us, we have Igor Akerera. He is a member of the Nigerian Guild of Editors. Thanks for joining us. Hello there and welcome to the program. We'll begin with this day newspaper. In this day, Tinubu leads Shatema, others in magnificent 64th Independence Anniversary Guards Parade. I mean, yesterday was the who is who at this low profile event. The president, vice president, uh, senate president, deputy senate president, chief justice of Nigeria, service chief, and the list continues. And the theme was apt, reflections on the past inspiring the future. But there's a lot of heavy lifting to be done in order for us to inspire ourselves for the future. Isn't it, uh, Igor? Um, Can you hear me, Igor? Right. Looks like um, we're having some technical no, difficulties. No, okay, we'll continue. We'll get back to him. Right. Okay, so, Ndi. Yeah, uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, when you look at the theme, the theme of this year's celebration says, reflecting the past. Yes. Inspiring the future is a good thing that Nigeria is 64. We're still together, that's something to celebrate. Mm. Like the Minister of uh, 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 Information said, Nigerians have, even the President, re resilient spirit. You know, yeah, we'll soon get back there. Have the resilient spirit. All these are good, you celebrate them. But then when you say reflect on the past, we reflect on the past, but the phrase inspiring the future, the question will be, are our leaders really inspiring right. the future? Igor is back. Y yes. Igor, did you hear our conversation? We're talking about uh, the this day headline on the anniversary. Yesterday, the, the president was there and the host of, you know, the rest of them. They talked about reflecting on the past and inspiring the future. And we're just discussing how we can inspire one another or how our leaders actually should be able to inspire the population well um, uh, absolutely it would appear as if um, the theme is right yes uh, the team was designed to resonate with many nigerians but in, in actual fact um, do we see uh, the government um, actually ready to reflect on the past. If the government is reflecting on the past, we do not see that evidence on the ground in terms of uh, political reforms, economic reforms, and then delivering very clear democracy dividends for Nigerians. So, well, the, the thing would seem apt, as I said, but um, Nigerians are really not interested in, in, in thematic approaches to solving uh, the country's problem right now. We can design everything that we want to design as, as a people. The government can say whatever it wants to say. But Nigerians are actually not impressed. and They are hungry. They are, they are poor. And they, they, they rather prefer that the government addresses those, those issues instead of, um, if you're reflecting on the past, people want to see work being done to address those issues. But right for now, I, I do not see um, um, concerted effort in that direction. Um, uh, Igor, and Nkechi, I would like you to come in here. When Igor talks about actually addressing those issues, Gov uh, Lagos State Governor Bajide Songwelu actually talked about people having uh, or being restive, and there's apathy and distrust. You know, he was warning uh, everyone, but it looks like he should be warning his colleagues and <laughs> authorities more. I mean, he's just speaking to what's going on, talking about uh, apathy and distrust that the people have for our leaders when it comes to everything that's going on. It's one thing to celebrate our national pride. It's one thing to reflect on the past 64 years. But when food prices are sky high, fuel costs are sky high, uh, the optimism can feel hollow. You also have the president also said, look, we're in a period of rebuilding. Other state governors, I think um, uh, Mackinde also said this uh, similar message of sort of perseverance and resilience. But in, this, in that theme, uh, reflecting on our past inspired by the future, what we've gone through in our past and the little strides that we've made should then inspire what should come for Nigerians and Nigeria as a country in the future. And you know, before we leave this topic, um, you wonder why Nigerians are resilient because they, we always use this word, Nigerians mm -hmm. are resilient. 
Is it partly because of the power of religion? People are highly religious and are always hopeful that God will intervene, that God will help to make tomorrow better. You, know, <laughs> you, have, you, have, you have hit it on the head, the nail on the head. The word is hope. Uh, someone says you can take everything, everything from a man, but the day you take hope, he dies. The reason for tomorrow is because there's hope, no matter how little. But you see, what the state governor of uh, Lagos. Lagos said, he, he encapsulated in just a few lines the entirety of what is happening in the country, what Nigerians are going through. And that will resonate with the people. That's how a leader should speak. It becomes another, a different game, whether it's just to talk or to act. And then talking about reflecting on the past and, and inspiring the future, the question will be again, are our leaders learning right. lessons okay. from past experiences to drive the future? Well, let's leave that there for now. Uh, we'll look at Punch newspaper. Flooding worsens despite 180 billion spent on dams, billion naira. Uh, protocol refinery misses seven production rollout deadline. And then you have Dadalawa's allegations against Matawale self-serving, according to analysts. October 1 protests record low turnout nationwide. Uh, I mean, it seems this administration has succeeded in dampening the resolve of people to protest. Igo, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I monitored the protest, uh, I mean, the planned protest yesterday. I drove around uh, the city center and across so many places in Abuja. Uh, uh, Ade Anju uh, led uh, a few persons in the city center and uh, the police quickly uh, fired tear gas and dispersed them. And so that was it. Uh, the tear gas that was fired by the police, uh, for me, I think it, it was unnecessary. If you look at what happened in, or if you compare what happened in Abuja to what happened in Lagos, where even the police commissioner in Lagos State uh, escorted or followed the protest, you know, the protesters and uh, provided security. In Abuja, I think, um, you know, the police is just too uh, frenetic. They are too quick at uh, dispersing, you know, uh, opposition voices or people who want to protest. Protest is a fundamental right. It's a human right. It's legally, uh, it's, it's legally provided for in the Constitution. The, 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 the police, the, uh, the police itself is a, is a product of the Constitution. And uh, protest or the right to self-expression is also a product, product of the Constitution. So the police and security agencies should allow Nigerians the, the, the space, because it is also part of democratic tenets in the first place, for Nigerians to freely express themselves. So at every given opportunity, the police is quick at firing tear gas and trying to deploy you know, a disproportionate force. I think that is not right. Nigerians should have the freedom to express themselves. The, the space should be free. And uh, the president himself and the ruling party should uh, be very careful not to stifle uh, the voices of the people because when you do that uh, what then happens is that people explore other means which may not uh, be favorable and may, may be antithetical to uh, to democracy and, and stability of the country and okay, Chi, in that guardian report the government speaks of patriotism but it cannot be wished it can patriotism cannot be wished um, I, I, a lot of governors I think this year that was sort of their main point in all their speeches, telling Nigerians to look, be patriotic, be, be patriotic so that all these things that we're working towards can bear the fruits. But you cannot put all that burden on Nigerians. Nigerians cannot be resilient, cannot be patient forever, cannot suffer. Someone said it's a sweet pain. Nigerians are tired of that, that sweet pain. And it's, it's funny that we're talking about hope uh, just a little bit earlier. And this administration, I think their tagline, their slogan is renewed, renewed hope. Renewed hope. However, hope is not a strategy. We need more than hope. It's not a strategy. We need more than hope. We need sustainable uh, development to lead right. this country along. It's just a slogan, you know, yes, as they always have. Okay, let's look at um, The Guardian. Protest, discontent, man, Nigeria's 64th Independence Day celebrations. CDHR advocates removal of states from federal structure. Mm, that's interesting. Southwest in need of modern ranches, not open grazing of old. Then Arofi, I didn't steal as governor. I'm ready to swear with the Quran. 
uh, as it pertains, the former governor of Kaduna State, he spoke um, at a live program in, in his state in Hausa language. The state assembly indicted him of misappropriating over 423 billion naira in eight years. That's a hefty sum. And he will have to defend himself in court. Swearing on the Quran may not be enough, ego. Well, uh, I read a report. Uh, former Governor Erufai uh, was given a condition for him to uh, swear by the Quran. He was saying if other leaders in, uh, who had uh, the governors of Kaduna State and uh, other political leaders in the past, if they agree to swear by the Quran or by the Bible as it were, that he himself will also come out to swear by the Quran. So I see that as a condition for him to come out clear on the allegations against him. Well, he has also said, the, the former governor also said that there are no specific areas where these allegations are tied to, where uh, his uh, administration allegedly misappropriated uh, the 423 billion. But the, the, the State House of Assembly has a duty, and they have uh, come out with those figures. They have also uh, pointed out that those monies, they could not trace uh, those monies to any project or tie to any project that was executed by the, the, the former governor. So I think the governor should come out clear rather than talk, uh, talk about Quran. Earlier we said Nigerians are too religious. We are very quick at uh, talking about God, God coming to solve our problems for us. But I don't think that is also a strategy. Put in, uh, in Keshi. So the governor should come out clear to uh, go before the, uh, the, the State House of Assembly to defend himself and answer to those allegations. Okay, let's look at daily trust. Protests in Lagos, Ondo, Oshu, halted in Abuja, Kano, Akwaib, and others shun demonstration. Independence Day, Jonathan Governor's Mark Day, that say Nigeria will overcome challenges. What an upbeat take on existence. Uh, existing conditions. Are you optimistic, Igor? Uh, well, I, I will encourage Nigerians to be optimistic. It's our country. We have no other country to, to, to go to. Uh, citizens of other countries are building their countries. And uh, so I think Nigerians should be optimistic in that regard. But in terms of, uh, sorry, with regards to those that we have elected, they have... Um, Perform below par and asking Nigerians to persevere and uh, you know to bear the, the, the brunt of misgovernance. I think that is not uh, the way to go about it. For former President Goodluck Jonathan, I see him as a patriot. Uh, he has also contributed his bit in saving um, democracy. Don't forget, in 2015, he ceded power to former President. Um, Muhammadu Buhari, when he said that his ambition is not worth the blood of, of, of any Nigerian. And so that, that is what I think um, Niger um, leaders should do in terms of sacrifices for their people. So when Jonathan speaks, Nigerians um, tend to listen. But when other, other leaders speak, um, Nigerians have their doubt. So there is need to be optimistic. There is need to be hopeful. But the hope should also start, or the, the optimism uh, should start with practical work uh, being done by those that are in position of authority. I mean, Ndi, are you hopeful? I mean, I guess if we're not, we won't be sitting down here in Nigeria. I am an incurable optimist, no matter what. That is good. You can't even live life without it, particularly in the face of dire situations. The only way to go is to believe the best and doubt the worst. And do the work, too. No, 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 no. Doing the work is, 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 is taken for granted. How can't you... Even the Almighty says, I will bless the work of your hands. So if you're not working and just praying, you're a fool. It's as simple as ABC. You mm. can't work, can't pray without working. It doesn't make sense. Message. So <laughs> the, the, the point here is that Erufai says the condition is funny if others swear. But again, it makes sense because... People should be brought to book, whether past or present leaders. But the most important thing about what Erufai is saying, let there be thorough investigation, not heat witch hunting, is his word against the, the Sani Uba government. So let there be thorough investigation. And if it's found wanting, he it should, it should, it should go in for it. All right. Let's look at the international headlines for you. We'll begin with Daily Graphic from Ghana. We won't fail you. EC assures uh, parties, the Electoral Commission of Ghana has assured all parties in the country that it will deliver a credible election in December. You know, the EC boss spoke at an inter-party advisory committee meeting. The country needs to hear these uh, 
type of assurance, don't you think, uh, Eo? Well, um, I agree with them that uh, I agree with the Ghana Electoral Commission that, um, you know, in terms of the promises they are given, that uh, they will not disappoint Ghanaians. In less than three months, Ghanaians will be going to the polls to elect uh, the president of the country and then uh, also uh, fill, fill up other positions. Uh, well, we hope that uh, the promise of the Ghana Electoral Commission will be different from that of uh, the Independent Electoral Commission in Nigeria. We, 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 we are here, we saw billions of uh, Naira voted to INEC in Nigeria to conduct uh, the presidential election and the off-cycle elections. In spite of the deployment of beavers and other technology, we have seen um, the output that it is clearly below par. The, the last one was the Edo election. So um, with regards to, to, to the Ghana uh, Electoral Commission, uh, I give it to them, there's need to, to believe what the commission is saying, but in less than three months, we will come back here to, to review and assess their performance, whether they have actually walked the talk and they have delivered on the expectation of the Ghanaian electorates. All right, let's look at citizens from South Africa. Gauteng, dry days ahead. Supply from Lesotho Highlands cuts. So councils must fix and enforce restrictions. Failure to do so will result in dry taps, uh, this report wants. I mean, the situation here seems to be dire in Kechi. Um, I mean, imagine living in a city and having to struggle with water availability. And one of the reasons is that there is scarcity from the dam. It's at 40% this year compared to 80% last year. I mean, it's a pressing issue that I think uh, the country has been facing and I think the citizen they've had this on their yes. front page for a, a couple for a while, for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have there's a lot of uh, restrictions I think they have level one restrictions that are now in place across uh, Gutang, carbon sort of non-essential water use and I don't think there's anything like <laughs> non-essential water use you can't wash your car they say they're saying hello to gray gray water revolution that's what they're calling it so residents are now being urged to sort of get creative make use of water from bats uh, and sinks for their gardens it's just i don't know how effective that will be really water is very essential so trying to demarcate what's essential water use and non-essential might be quite difficult no, it's important okay. because you know you talked about yeah, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, finish your it talked about leaks. Right. It talked about bust pipes. Right. There should be what you call prevention better than cure. People should not wait for those things to happen before they take action. So they should learn to fix that. So we'll be talking about even whether there's water not coming from the dam or not. Right. Okay, let's look at the sun. Israel under attack. Hellfire. <laughs> it's a very interesting... Uh, uh, front page today. A 200 missile blitz by Iran, Tel Aviv terror rage, or, or rampage rather, RAF fighter jets scrambled. Yeah, 200 missile looks like a hellfire. You can imagine being under that kind of onslaught. You have that story dominating all headlines. Here. Let's look at Daily Mail. The Iron Dome holds firm against Iran's 200 missile blitz. Now Israel vows vengeance. Uh, Daily Mirror. Fears of all-out war, revenge from above. Ir Iran retaliates for Israel's incursion into Lebanon with missile onslaught. And then you also have, uh, let's see, The Guardian. Israel vows to retaliate after Iran launches missile attack. Let's move on to the Daily Telegraph. Iran attacks Israel. And then I newspaper, Iran missile attack on Israel sparks fears of new war. I mean, it does sound like um, real hellfire. This is Iran's ir 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 retaliation for that ground invasion of Lebanon. We are inching closer to an all-out war, it seems, or in, in about 30 seconds because we're almost out of time. Well, basically, um, the world has been expecting this uh, since the assassination of uh, Ismail Haniyeh, the, uh, the, the leader of Hamas in, uh, in Tehran. Um, uh, the, the Tehran government has vowed that they have a response. And so with over 182 missiles, don't forget that, that was the first time um, the Iranian uh, authorities were, will be deploying a supersonic uh, missile against um, the state of Israel. 
Now, with, with those missiles raining in yesterday, I sat to watch in awe. I, I, I'm sure the, most people around the world you know, were glued to their seat in awe. And then we also saw celebrations in Iran, in Pakistan, in, uh, in, in Gaza, and all that. All of these uh, tend to point to one direction, that the world right now is, is, is at edge, and Israel has vowed a very strong response. And with the support of the United States, the U.S. itself has said that Israel has a right to, to, to respond. So we wait to see how Israel responds. And but this is all just pointed to an escalation of uh, the conflict in the Middle East. All right. Unfortunately, that's all we have for the paper review this morning. All right. All thank right. you so much, Dr. Constance Ikoku. Thank you, Igo Akeria. I hope I didn't butcher your name. That's all the time we have here on Daybreak. It's goodbye from me and Kate Chittenana. Up next is The Morning Show. Thanks for watching. I am Ndi Amogwa.